Hello and welcome to On the Marie Curie Couch, the podcast that aims to break down taboos and start open, honest conversations about death and dying. I'm Jason Davidson. I'm a social worker by profession and I've worked in palliative care, hospice care and bereavement support services for more than a decade. Each episode, we'll be speaking to a well-known guest to find out about how they feel about their own mortality and how their personal experience of bereavement has shaped the way they live their life. Today, I'm on the Marie Curie couch with John Altman. John Altman's an actor who's best known for playing nasty Nick Cotton in BBC Soul East Enders. John's also appeared in films including Star Wars Return of the Jedi, Quadrophenia, and An American Werewolf in London. A lover of music, John starred as Chicago's Billy Flynn in over 500 theatre performances, as well as releasing his own music. John lives in Surrey, and his autobiography, In the Nick of Time, is available to download from Audible now. John Altman, welcome to the Marie Curie Couch. Thank you, Jason. Good to be here. Good. So, as you know, one of the main aims for this podcast is to encourage conversations around death and dying and bereavement. And I'd like to start, John, by asking if you could talk about a significant bereavement that you've experienced in your life. Well, at the age of 71, I've had a, a few bereavements. I suppose more recently, my mother passed away uh, a few years ago now, but uh, she and I were very close. But I like to think when I had to start dealing with people passing away, years and years ago, a friend of mine who was, I was at art school with, he uh, tragically um, committed suicide. Now, that was quite a shock for me because none of us knew that that was going to happen. I mean, my granny died when I was quite little and an aunt of mine, a few relatives, but I didn't really think about it. And um, the other when my friend died, that was a bit of a shock. So I had to kind of deal with that, if you like. And of course, I had a lot of friends that knew him as well. And it took us all by surprise, you know. We didn't realise he was going to do it. But latterly, as time has moved on, I've tried to embrace the thought of death um, who said that it will probably be a truly great adventure. Was that the man who wrote Peter Pan? Yes, I think he said that would be truly great. And I, I like to look at it like that, actually. And, and I, don't, I don't have a fear of it. There might have been a time I was, maybe when I was a little, I might have, I, I feared death and etc. But for most of my life, I don't seem to have done. I do have, um, if you like, a faith. I'm spiritual. I believe in a higher power. Uh, I believe there's a lot to be gleaned from all forms of religion. I'm not sure to say if I, I, I was religious, even though I do go to church, but I glean a lot of comfort from, uh, say, the words of Buddha, Muhammad, or Jesus. And uh, I think there's a lot on this planet that we don't know as yet. Unanswered questions. I mean, it's an extraordinary place, this planet, when you look at it. The changing of the seasons, the millions and trillions of stars that surround us and galaxies. You know, I remember one of the big, biggest thoughts I've ever had is what's at the end of the universe? Well, one likes to think it might be heaven, but uh, which will lead me on to a, a book. I don't know if anybody's, um, who's listening has ever read the book Proof of Heaven. It's uh, a neurosurgeon's journey into the afterlife, and it's an extraordinary story. I read it a few years ago. In fact, June Brown, who's my screen mother, she recommended it to me. And I couldn't put it down, actually, because what happened was he was um, well, he went into a coma after suffering a rare form of bacterial meningitis and scans of his brain revealed massive damage. He wasn't expected to survive. Uh, His family prepared themselves for the worst. But something miraculous happened. Dr. Alexander's brain went from near total inactivity to awakening. He woke a changed man, certain of the infinite reach of the soul certain of a life beyond death it would take me too long to explain everything in this book but i would highly recommend it to people proof of heaven a neurosurgeon's journey into the afterlife dr eben alexander a couple of other things that i marked last night just if i can see them he talks of love you know 
he went on a journey, basically, a spiritual journey out of his physical form. And he, a voice said to him at one point, you are loved and cherished. You have nothing to fear. There is nothing you can do wrong. And if I, it says here, if I had to boil this entire message down to one sentence, it would run this way. You are loved. And there was another little bit at the back I found. Oh, yes, this is a lovely story regarding the afterlife. The next morning I was in our bedroom reading more of the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross book. This book was called On Life After Death. When I came to a story about a 12-year-old girl, this is, this is all true, I hasten to add, who underwent an NDE, near-death experience, and at first didn't tell her parents about it. Finally, however, she could no longer keep it to herself and confided in her father. She told him about travelling to an incredible landscape full of love and beauty and how she met and was comforted by her brother. The only problem, the girl told her father, is that I don't have a brother. Tears filled her father's eyes. He told the girl about the brother she did indeed have, but who had died just three months before she was born. Makes me feel quite emotional. Thank you for sharing, you know, those sections of the book that you just read out. And I was interested in, I suppose, the sections that you'd chosen, so that you'd chosen to read today. My sense of them was that one of the important themes, it sounds like, was love, especially the first one, I think, kind of, you are loved. And can you say just a bit about what that meant for you when reading the book and coming across that and linked to life and death? Well, even though I have no fear of death, I often think, I think, think oh, I'll miss some of the music that I have, you know, uh, I'll miss the sunrise and the sunset, but there will be better things, I think. And um, as you said, I believe there could be very powerful love beyond our earthly habitat, if you like. <laughs> Thank you. The other thing, and just going back a bit now, sorry, just to the beginning of the conversation, you mentioned that when you were younger, when you were a child, that a grandparent had died. So there had been some experience of death when you were young. And what I was interested in was what messages you remember receiving about death and dying when you were young, as in, was it something that was spoke about? So sometimes some of our guests say, no, 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 no. Death and dying was never spoke about in the household. It was never spoken about at all. And others say, yeah, there was open conversations about it. I don't think it was um, in any way not to be talked about. I probably asked my mother where my auntie went or whatever. My mother might have said, oh, she'd gone to heaven, I suppose. But I can't actually remember Oh, I, there's one thing that I thought you might ask me, or I, I wanted to mention, is that is latterly in my life, preparing for um, someone's passing, which I, I think is important, rather than, as, as you, you, I think you intimated earlier, people not wanting to talk about it. I think it's so important to be able to do that. People don't even talk about wills sometimes. Well, they, oh, I can't talk about that now. No, no, that, that's, that, do you know what I mean? You must have heard that many times. So what, what I've done for myself, having studied many, as I say, many different spiritual paths in my life, and, and I do have a, a, a strong spiritual belief, is to try and prepare yourself, not to get depressed or get the blues, but to put yourself, even if you cry, doesn't matter, put yourself in the situation uh, mentally whereby, say, imagining losing your loved one, your mother, your father, not to ignore the event which is in inevitable, but to, um, if you like, spin it around in, in your mind and, and think about it deeply and how you will feel, because you never truly know how you feel once a loved one has gone. But I think some preparation, rather than ignoring the fact they're going to go, is important. And also, if you've anything you need to make up with them, do that. Uh, like with my mother, she lived to 96, bless her. As I say, we were very close. She um, and I... I think we said everything we needed to, you know, I mean, I told her I loved her and I thanked her for everything she'd done for me in my life. Um, and to please forgive me for being such a naughty boy when I was little. That was a bit of a terror. <laughs> sort of where Nick Cotton came from, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, um, 
So that that's in preparation is important, and a lot of the, a lot of times when I've seen I've befriended I've befriended quite a few elderly people, uh, mainly ladies uh, later in my life, and and often they'll they'll say to me, oh they're getting tired, or I think my mother, I said I'll see you next week then, mother. I'm just going to see her most Sundays, and she said, well maybe dear, and then maybe not. <laughs> we shall see, won't we? <laughs> it's like I might not be here, but if I am, all well and good. So. <laughs> you know, that didn't really upset me all that. It just, that just, just my mother, you know, being forthright. And I think towards the end, she was tired. She'd, she'd done everything she wanted to do. I was with her at the end, because it's not always, as, as with birth, it's not always possible to be there, is it? And you can't time it, can you? Can't time death or birth. You can never put a time on any of it. So, yeah, I was in the hospital in Canterbury with my sister. My sister was reading a book. I mentioned a little... Uh, prayer that I, that I repeat, that I, that I do every night, uh, to my sister. And then my sister turned to me and said, I think, because my mother wasn't talking, but they say that hearing is the last thing to go. You probably know that. And um, my sister said, uh, I think mother's gone, John. And I looked, and she had. And uh, I like to think that the last thing she heard was the little prayer that I'd recited. There's no such thing as, I suppose, a, an enjoyable passing, but entirely but uh, it was as good as it could have got i must say it could have been yeah it was, it, was, it was good you pleased you were there very yeah very so i wasn't there for my father i was working miles away so uh yeah but i went to see him in the uh chapel of rest as they call it that was a bit strange to see my father uh yeah it was a bit odd what was strange about it john well seeing my father laid to rest uh i guess the position that he died in, he was still sort of like that. And I kissed his forehead and he was cold. And uh, it's very odd. Just that, those are probably the two things that I remember the most, really. And I probably spoke, said a few words to him. I sat there for a little while. I just wanted to be with him uh, before he was cremated. And uh, I was glad I did that. Mind you, in his latter days, he may not, may or may not have recognised me. He didn't recognise my mother near, near the end. That was probably... Uh, dementia creeping in yeah and that and you know that that's not something that's discussed about lots as well yet when a loved one does die it's often a decision that people are faced with whether or not to go to the chapel of rest and see the person who's died and some people can feel quite conflicted about that you know people don't know whether it's the right thing to do or whether it's the wrong thing to do whether they should do it whether it's okay if they don't you know uh, it can be a tough decision indeed yes i've heard people say i said did you did you go and see them in the travel they said no 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 i don't want to do that no no i guess we're all different aren't we we all cope with uh bereavement in different ways but um as i said before i think there are ways to, to prepare if it's possible in any way, I think if you have a some form of spiritual uh, faith, um, that helps too. I, I really do. It's given me great uh, energy at times of despair. Sometimes, you know, uh, just just to have that believing in a higher power. You know, I think if I was asked that question by somebody, you know, about whether to go to a chapel arrest or not, I would certainly encourage them to do what they felt like they wanted to do and that if they were worried about going to the chapel arrest whether they could take someone with them who might not necessarily come into the room with them but might be there afterwards to wait yes. outside and that if they decided they didn't want to go then I think to be kind of open and honest with other family around them just to say that it's something that they don't choose and that that's okay as well and to be I suppose okay themselves with that decision as well because it's not a wrong one you know I think when you're grieving as you've just touched on you've got so much to deal with try not to put more pressure on yourself you know to do things that other people might think are right when it really doesn't feel right for you quite yeah, that's uh, not, not, not something you want. There's pressure from other people at, at a time of, of, of great loss. I think uh, I was, I was, while you've been talking, I was thinking also, if you do, if, if, you, if you want to, if you decide to go to a chapel, uh, it, it's a form of closure too, I think. You know, it's just like they definitely are gone. There's no way they're going to like, like come back from the, the situation that they're in. That's it. And of course, it'd be the cremation or the burial. So for me, seeing my father was, um, yeah, 
a, a closure because I couldn't be there when he when he did die, bless his heart. So yeah, that 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 helped. Of course, in in in, in other countries, uh, I think in Ireland, especially with, with the, the Catholic faith, they'll have the, the the family member laid out in the front room, won't they? Uh, quite a lot, like Italy and places like a, a lot of countries in the world, they'll have the deceased laid out. People will come see them. They're like they're lying there. Yeah. England's a funny old place sometimes when it comes to emotions and dealing with and it's like looking after our elderly. You know, we've been sort of in all these homes now, but uh, I don't think we're the best country in the world for t- taking care of the elderly sometimes. So I've heard anyway, unlike the extended families you have in India and, and Italy, this is, what, this is what I gather and I don't know if it's still the case. I hope not. I think that's really important, though, what you've just said, John, you know, about the fact that, you know, some of these rituals with open coffins, um, going to the chapel at rest, then, um, you know, it can be helpful in that it's you, you see that it's final. You see that somebody's gone, that they're not breathing anymore, you know, that they're not... Yes moving anymore you know they're kind of you see death you're faced with it and there's that kind of finality about that isn't there which can be which can be helpful um for people you know can be helpful for people just to get their head around it and what's happened especially if they've not seen a dead body before Mm, yeah closing the door on that person's life yeah just yeah the end of the story yeah final page of the book if you like Christmas can be challenging for many of us, but for families experiencing dying, death or bereavement, it can often feel impossible. Help Marie Curie be there when it counts by funding care, comfort and joy for even more people during these toughest of times. Search Marie Curie Christmas. If you'll be missing someone special this Christmas and need to talk, we're here. Marie Curie's support line is open over the festive period. Call 0800 090 2309 or visit mariecurie.org.uk forward slash support. Thinking about bereavement and um, grief, so when people who, who you're close to have died, and I can hear that um, your spirituality is something that's important to you, and you've said it, that that's helpful. What else has helped you in grief? I guess the comfort of friends, yeah. Friends and family, yeah. And, and talking about it. Also, I keep a journal, which I find quite therapeutic. Well, I've kept a diary on and off for years and years, but... Uh, constantly, pretty much, apart from the year I divorced, uh, I've, I've kept a journal every day since 1984. So I find that I'll be something, maybe I don't want to talk to somebody about it or it's just not something that I can't talk to somebody about it because of, you know, whatever. So I'll write I'll write um, my feelings down, my emotions, my thoughts, yeah, how it all yeah, affected me. I put it all on paper. And it's amazing. You might not think it works, but uh, it does actually. It's, it's quite therapeutic. It, work, it works well, but ultimately, other people, you know, pick up the phone, meet with people, a hug, you know, a hug, yeah, a good old hug. You can't beat that. I think um, that's so true as well. When you're just saying, you know, saying talking to people, um, so talking to people about how you're feeling and how the grief's impacting on you, but also reminiscing about the person who's died, storytelling, especially if they knew them as well. Yes, indeed. Yeah, and you, you remember the funny times you had and you know, the eccentricities of them. Uh, yeah, maybe they know stories that you didn't. Yeah. I've been to about six funerals this year, Jason. Really? Would this you believe year? It? That's a lot. That's a lot, John. Mm. Being the age I am, maybe it's just yeah. So it's been interesting, including my uh, my former partner, a lady called Diana Marchment, who was an actress, and I spent quite a few years with. That was tough. Many tears. Many tears. Just before I move on to my next question, um, one thing I ask every guest who comes on the podcast is the name of the person who died if you're happy to share it you spoke about your mum earlier what's your mum's name my mother's name was uh, tina florence stewart originally schofield it was her side of the family where the uh, theatrical genes if you like came from oh, really? <laughs> her father was uh, quite a successful actor yeah did quite a few films johnny schofield jr if you look him up on the internet you'll see he did a lot actually it was all you could rely on him apparently to come and do the job he was a good character actor so yeah my mother tina florence stewart was her married name and uh bless her yeah she was a great mum and did she do any acting 
Uh, she did a bit when she was younger. She was a great ballet dancer as well. She played the violin and the piano. Uh, she actually went out with um, Bernard Lee, who played uh, M in the James Bond films. <laughs> he was a lot older than her. And she was a young starlet in London, staying with my grandfather in Soho. And I, I think they must have met on a film set or something. But anyway, my grandfather, Johnny, who, who was a lovely chap, but he didn't want his girls to go into the business at all. So uh, he, I think he got wind that Bernard Lee had asked my mother out and he put, he just put a stop to it immediately. <laughs> my father could have been a completely different person. <laughs> so there you go. There's a, bit, a little bit of a showbiz trivia for you. Oh, yeah, Bernard, you, know, you know, remember, I don't know how old you are, Jason. Bernard Lee was the M in the original Bond films. Good actor. That's so nice. Yeah, I'm going to change tack slightly. You've touched on this already, John, but can I ask if you ever think about your own death? Yeah, I do, actually. Um, and I'm 71 now, and I'm really, I've really got to have a, a big clear out. You know, <laughs> I've got so much memorabilia, and a lot of it's worth worth money. So um, I'm going to try and uh, sort it all out, catalogue it, a lot of the memorabilia. I've got like movie posters and things like that, and, and, and sell it all off. And then any other stuff, give it to charity, because I, I don't want anyone to be um, having a clear <laughs> where you can't see. I'm very tidy and clean, but I've got, Lots of boxes of things, books. I've got vinyl, got a few things, yeah. So, uh, yeah, and, um, thinking about death, I still, as I said before, uh, apart from the wonderful uh, experiences of Dr. Eben Alexander and Proof of Heaven, I like to think I will be heading off somewhere like that. And um, I would like to think that when I'm dying, I would be with the ones I love, i.e. my daughter, uh, my, my granddaughter, uh, and, and anyone else is around. Um uh, who's close in my family, my cousin, yeah, etc. So I wouldn't like to suffer death under torture. <laughs> I wouldn't like a pain. Obviously, I shouldn't think anybody would want a painful death. Yeah, a peaceful death, I guess. I mean, I think, my, like, like with my mother, I think she was ready to go. And what happened with her was, I don't, you never know, do you? She might have instigated it physically, subconsciously. She actually had a stroke in her sleep. So she never came back to consciousness. So she drifted away and she was in hospital for three days. And as I said, we, we were talking to her, but she, she couldn't talk anymore. And uh, so she just sort of, I was in the space of two or three days, she just sort of drifted away, if you like. Yeah, I suppose a peaceful death would be good, surrounded by loved ones. But as I said earlier, you just never know, do you? The planes come over here from Heathrow, you know, one might land on the village I live in, you know, <laughs> you don't know, do you? Or a bus might suddenly go careering across the, the road into your car. You just don't know. Uh, when your number's up, it's up, I guess, but we can... Try and be careful and not, not have it up too too quickly. Or yeah, try, try and be careful, be cautious. Absolutely, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I yeah. agree. You never know, but let's hope those planes just stay in the sky above your house. Yeah, let's hope so. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yes, indeed, let's hope so. Yeah, is legacy something that's important to you, John? As in, how you'd like to be remembered? Um, yeah, I'd like to be remembered with um, with affection. I guess a man. It was generous when I could be, you know, financially and otherwise. And with my time, I take care of people when I can who have a alcohol problem, you know, and I've managed to stop people heading off down that very dangerous road and survive and live and be happily married with children. And so it's a, it's a great pleasure to me to see that occur with people that I've, I've helped. And um, so, yeah, I suppose to be remembered... With affection and a sense, sense of my, my sense of humour. Yeah, I can't think of anything else really. But oh, well, how could I forget? And and to, for people to enjoy uh, any films or TV programmes that, that I've done in the past. You know, that, that they will hopefully still enjoy them long after I passed away. Oh, how could I forget? And my autobiography. <laughs> in the nick of time, they can read that and enjoy that. And also uh, the music. I've written quite a lot of music over the years. I've got an album out there called It's Never Too Late to Rock and Roll under the name of Johnny Altman, which is my rock and roll persona because there's another musician called John Altman. I don't know if you know him at all. Lovely chap. He, uh, we met years ago and we've remained friends, actually. We actually did a gig one time. It was called John Altman Presents John Altman at the Pheasantry in the Pheasantry in Chelsea. And he used to know the Python, so he's got a great sense of humour. I'd love to have got into comedy, actually. I've done a little bit over the years, but um, not enough. I don't know, I've got this sort of zany side to me that's never really come out in performance but yeah uh those are the things yeah to fondly re remember me listening to the music seeing the films and if they'd seen me in the theater fond memories of that i guess 
I think that probably covers it, I hope. You'll be leaving quite the legacy. Yeah, I don't know if I'll be leaving millions yet, but I'm still working on that. <laughs> it's tough, it's tough, tough being an actor sometimes. I tell you, you know. Yeah, there you go. Just before we finish, John, can I just ask how it's been for you today, being on the Marie Curie couch and having these conversations? Oh, what can I say? Sum it up in a few words that it's been great to meet you. Uh, it's wonderful to be supporting Marie Curie again. And uh, thank you for, what can I say, an intelligent and uplifting interview that you've given me. I just want to say thank you for everything you're doing in the field that we've been discussing. And um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I feel quite uplifted having spoken to you. Thank you. That's good. Well, John Altman, thank you for joining me on the Marie Curie couch today. Thanks for being generous with your experiences and, you know, being up for having open and honest conversations. And it was very lovely to meet you. My pleasure. So that's all for this episode of On the Marie Curie Couch. We hope it's got you thinking about matters of life and death and perhaps starting those conversations with your own friends and family. Marie Curie's here to help. From planning ahead to coping with bereavement, you can talk through any concerns you have around the end of life with our support line team, which also includes specially trained nurses. Call us on 0800 090 2309 or search Marie Curie online. This podcast is produced and edited by Marie Curie with support from Ultimate Content. The music featured is Time Lapse by Pan Oceanic. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please do like and subscribe. Thanks for listening. And until next time, goodbye.